Welcome to the latest edition of the Teamsters podcast. I'm Kara Dennis of the Teamsters Communications Department. In this episode, we will hear how Teamsters pitched in to help their fellow union members in the wake of Hurricane Ida's destruction along the Gulf Coast. It was just the latest example of Teamsters rising to the occasion when disaster strikes. My colleague, Matt McQuaid, has more. Matt? Thanks, Kara. On August 29th, Hurricane Ida made landfall in Louisiana. It was the eighth hurricane to hit the state within the past decade and the 18th tropical storm overall. There have been at least 82 casualties in the Gulf Coast attributed to Ida, making it the second deadliest hurricane to hit the region within the past 50 years. It surpassed only by Hurricane Katrina, which hit Louisiana on the exact same day. Every hurricane season, the Teamsters hit the ground running to help those recovering from storms. Local 769 business agent David Renshaw serves as the IBT Southern Region Disaster Relief Coordinator. He was in charge of the relief mission after Hurricane Ida. I received a phone call to uh, volunteer to uh, take the uh, task and to um, see what we can do on behalf of our brothers and sisters that were impacted by Hurricane Ida. The first method was to uh, establish points of contact uh, within the region prior to uh, me even getting on the ground. Um, And one of the purposes of that is to what I call try to implement a hub and spoke distribution center, Uh, meaning the fact of before we can ask for goods, um, we have to have a location to receive the goods. Uh, Before we can receive the goods, um, we have to have a proper assessment um, of of, of the storm, right? The aftermath, Um, though hurricanes are predominantly uh, common of the outcome, there's a difference between a windstorm um, and a flood storm. So as we're implementing a location of a distribution to receive the donations, uh, we're simultaneously obtaining Uh, information on the ground as far as their current urgent needs. After making an assessment, David worked with Joint Council 75 President Jim Sherman and local 991 Secretary Treasurer Jim Gookins to assemble a crew of Teamsters to get supplies to the affected areas. Here's Jim Sherling. Joint Council 75 got got involved with uh, disaster relief uh, several, several years ago, and I guess the first one was when, uh, I can't even remember the name of the storm that came through, uh, uh, the Mobile in, in Panhandle of Florida a couple of years ago. Uh, we saw, we we hooked up with the Florida AFL and, and uh, put together some uh, supplies, really started as, as delivering supplies into the area that many of our members needed at a local 991. Uh, it became very apparent that um, we needed to put some kind of project together uh, within our joint council because in the state of Florida and uh, in the whole Gulf region there, it's not if it happens again, it's when it's going to happen again. Um, we get the bulk of the tornadoes and, and hurricanes coming through through that area. So uh, after that storm, we had uh, we put out to all of our affiliate locals, anyone that wanted to go to uh, uh, disaster relief training, and we started sponsoring members from uh, from our 10 locals to go to these trainings and had a, a great response. So we have, uh, we probably have a team of about 10, 10 members throughout our joint council who have uh, been certified in disaster relief and are, and are ready to go um, with a phone call, uh, just, as, uh, just as we put together for this last hurricane. All five of the members that went with David, Justin Peacock, Jeff Cook, Robbie Ellison, Cameron Brown, and Kenny Barringer came out of local 991. Here's Jim Gookins. Called each one of them, then you interviewed him so you know who they are, and asked them one if they would be willing to do it. Um, and if they were, it would it would involve extensive travel. They would be away from home, and there would be no guarantee as far as how many hours they would be working. It would be working uh, basically until you dropped. I contacted the folks that I that I felt that I could depend on, and they were all more than willing. Uh, they went through all the training at subsequent to that, all the training that they were uh, for hazmat. And, um, heck, you know, they, they would constantly tell me, look, 
next one comes up, just give us a call. We're all willing to do it. We, we, we enjoy helping out. Um, so they, they've pretty much become our go-to team, uh, at least from my jurisdiction. And now as it turned out, um, and in another jurisdiction as well. Why do you think these five guys in particular are perfect for this assignment? For some reason they seem to get along. So they work together. Well, um, they've all been hard workers. They're all leaders in their building. Um, they've been stewards. These aren't two week stewards. They're, uh, stewards that have been doing it for a long time. So they've accepted the leadership role in, in the, uh, in the locations that they're at. So, they, they all kind of think alike. They're all made of the same cloth, so to speak. And they, they all get along well together. Um, so they, they just really meshed, which was really impressive to see. You know, you always wonder about, you know, five people coming from five different areas, whether they're going to get along. And um, heck, they, they not only get along, they, they stay in constant contact with each other um, during the interim period. So they're, they're, they're really... Uh, close-knit group. The crew made the long drive from Florida, Louisiana, spending 12 to 16 hour days obtaining and distributing supplies throughout Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Slidell, and the other cities lining the state's Gulf Coast. According to Robbie Ellison and Kenny Barringer, it was a tremendous undertaking. So and look, there's a lot to it, man. I mean, it, it's, there's more to it than just getting a truck and showing up at a warehouse with a bunch of stuff. You know, you got people who, who, um, approve that kind of thing you got the you know you got people who go track down the trucks you've got people who are putting in orders at places like costco lining up what time you're supposed to be there making sure you got the people to be there then you're lining up those people when they leave there to go meet other people and pick them up and then head to another area and then you know especially the situation like we were in where you know there's no hotel rooms or nothing so you got somebody else who's talking to someone else in the state that you really don't know who's lining up a place for you to stay in our situation we actually stayed at a house that was owned by the firefighters union, which was very nice of them to loan it to us. It was very comfortable accommodations and things. But you know, so there's somebody working behind the scenes trying to get all this stuff together in a matter of a day or two while you're basically on your way there. So there's a lot to it. You know, you know, it's, it's a lot to it. I think people should understand that and, and should appreciate the people who are on the phones and stuff like that. Cause it's not always easy, especially when you pick up the phone and you say, Hey, um, when is a truckload of water? It's supposed to be here. Uh, it's supposed to be here Tuesday at ten. But let me call someone else and I'll find out. And then it takes that person an hour or so to find out. You're waiting because you pretty much need an answer now. You know, there's a lot to it. There's a lot of pressure. People who are coordinating and stuff. You know, my hats off to them too because things don't always go as planned. And you know, they're sitting there stressing over the phone over all the things that are that are happening and where's this? Why hasn't this person called back? So it's a, you have to have a lot of patience while you're doing it too. I mean, you just a lot of patience because, like I said, you're in a disaster area and you're relying on this person talking to this person who's talking to this person who talked to a truck driver who's bringing the water. You know, that kind of stuff, you know, you, you, it can get – that times can be off, you know, day, a day can be off, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, that's the other thing too. So I definitely say patience is one of the things that people have to understand. Nobody, not everybody's going to know the answer right then. It just – it ain't going to happen. But your day is start early. I mean, you're going to get up at five o'clock in the morning. You're going to head to wherever it's at to load your stuff up. You're going to start getting your, you know, we're going, you need to go here. You guys need to go here, here, and here. You're getting all your addresses. You're getting your, like I said, you get your contact points of people you're going to talk to. You, you try to get a, you know, a text message or whatever of all this information. Plus you try to write it down too, because a lot of these areas you're going to, they may not have cell phone service. So you, you're not going to be able to just pick up your phone and go Google Maps. You got to build, you got to know where you're going. So there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot to it. You know, your day starts early, but it's, it's, it's worth it. Like I said, when you pull up and drop stuff off to people and they're in desperate need, I mean, you're just, you're just giving them your time. You know, I don't mind giving my time for somebody. If it helps really someone else's stress who's been through something like that, you know, having their lives turned upside down for a week or two, then, um, you know, if me showing up, taking, t- taking time out of my schedule to just bring them water, bring something that they need, you know, like I said, that's rewarding, and I don't mind doing it. We all work together, you know. Whatever anybody needed, that's what we did. No questions asked. They tell us to drive to uh, South New Orleans and come back, and then drive to Slidell. That's what we did, you know. I th- I think just 
just in those six days, I think we drove 2,000 miles delivering supplies. And that's just one truck. But there was a lot of members without power for a week. So, you know, we got to get the got to get the ice to them. We got to get food to them, supplies, tarps for their roofs, flashlights, all that stuff. And that's what we did. We took them the necessities till they could get by for a week or two without power. And uh, that's the Teamsters. The job was challenging, but the crew was motivated. The Hurricane Ida Teamsters weren't just veterans because of their experience working hurricanes. They have also lived through them. Justin Peacock explains. I've, I've been through them, many of them, so it's pretty bad. You, you know, you, you, after the storm, you get outside and you start assessing your damage. Um, a lot of times, I mean, like I had a lot of damage after Hurricane Sally. So um, you don't have power, so you have to deal with that. Um, you have to di- clean out all of your refrigerated products. A lot of times you just eat everything you got and then um, and then you start checking on your neighbors and then, you know, then you've got to deal with work. Like, how do I get to work or do I have work? You know, is there is there a building there? So there's a lot of, um, you know, you get used to it over the years <laughs> living on the Gulf Coast. You get everything kind of planned out. Um, you know, power starts coming back within probably a week or two. I mean, sometimes I know during Hurricane Ivan, um, it was like two weeks. It was pretty bad. Um, and that's really hard. Um, gas is another problem. Fuel, um, you've got to plan. You need to pre-plan. When these things are coming on shore, you've got to start prepping to get things done. Team member Jeff Cook echoed the sentiment. Down here, unfortunately, we have, we come across these hurricanes uh, numerous times throughout the year. And it's only a matter of time, like I, we were talking about, before those people in Louisiana and Mississippi will have to come to Florida to assist us and help us and help our brothers and sisters out here. So we all really need to reach out at these times and, and do what we can to make it easier to get these people back up on their feet and be able to uh, carry on with their lives and go to work. It gave me the pride to be able to, to know that I was doing something that would, would help benefit uh, people of that community. You know, a lot of people said, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. A lot of people do strike checks and give money and give what they can. But to actually put boots on the ground and get it done and look in people's eyes and see that, uh, thank you very much for what you do. I, I didn't know where my next meal was coming from. It really tugs at your heartstrings. We're not just uh, just individuals that care nothing but about the Teamsters. Teamsters care about everybody. Teamsters are everybody. They're everybody from truck drivers to Coca-Cola to delivery of other waste managements to to build, to making hats to doing all kinds of uh, employment. So Teamsters are out there. You you never know who you your your neighbor is and who could be a Teamster. So the best thing to do is just do what you can for each individual. So did Kenny and Robbie. I tell you, if it, if it happened to me, and it has happened to me, and I've had to get assistance, you know, being without power for a week or two, no food because there's no nothing open. It's, it, it's, it's really nice to see people that give, at, you know, when people need it the most. And and that's what that's what we pretty much do is the Teamsters and the AFL come together and they provide they provide a lot to these families. And it, it's just it 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 just it makes me real happy. Let's just say that that I can be a part of it. Growing up here all my life, there's been some times where we've been hit with three or four hurricanes during the year. I can remember being a kid where we would get hit by hurricanes and we would turn around two weeks later when you're still picking things up and just got power and another hurricane comes. And so, yeah, I mean, I understand, you know, a lot about hurricanes and things like that. And like I said, we travel around and do this stuff. You get to see some of the areas that have been impacted by the storm up real close. And it's, you know, it's, it's just pretty amazing to see how devastating a storm can be, whether it's, you know, surge of water, wind. I mean, 
you always see something you haven't seen before. So it's pretty eye opening. Probably the worst thing I saw was the worst area we went into was when we went down towards um, Venice and Port Sulphur, which was South Louisiana on one of their little, you know, it's kind of like a finger. I mean, you can drive down a, a, it was a four lane highway, but two lanes were completely underwater. So we were traveling on two lanes of the highway. And, you know, if you're familiar with Louisiana, they have lots of levees that keep water out because the ground level is so low. And when we were running down to Port Sulphur, you can see the levee on the left side of you, and you can see it on the right side of you. I mean, it was only a separation of about six, 700 yards. I mean, you can see it. And probably the thing that stuck out the most was the fact that you could see all the ships lined up on the levees where the port had been closed due to the storm, so that the port was backed up, the Port of New Orleans. And then there was so much uh, land down there flooded that you had a lot of cattle and stuff, so you had a lot of dead animals on the side of the road that, you know, couldn't swim or, or drowned or whatever during the storm. And so they just had them pushed off the side of the road because, like I said, they were trying to get power stuff restored. And, um, you know, when you go into a place and you see 50 power trucks in line or you see an island out in the middle of a bunch of water that's got, you know, $4 million worth of equipment like track hoes and things sitting on it and you can't even use them because they're, out, they're basically on an island, that's pretty that, – that kind of stuck out the most. I'd never seen that much – flood water sitting in one area at one time. Jeff remembers that highway as well. Homes were floated off their foundations, turned upside down. Uh, there were dead animals on the side of the road. There were tractors uh, and big heavy equipment, what they used to maintain the levees that were underwater at that time. Uh, the power company was down there trying to uh, restore power to get the power pumps running. Uh, this particular Port Charlotte, we met up with the uh, ex-president of the parish and a uh, representative for the state down there. We took them uh, pallets of water. Unfortunately, they were unable to drink the water in that area. They were unable to cook with the water in that area. So we uh, that was our last drop and we loaded them up. FEMA had just arrived and the Red Cross was getting set up. So we dropped, uh, I think it was four to six pallets of water for those individuals so they could come by and pick up water and be able to use it to drink and to cook with. Well, the reaction from the parish president and also from the uh, representatives was thank you, thank you, thank you. They were in awe that we would come all the way from Florida just to lend a helping hand to make sure their little parish would uh, have some necessities to help get back on their feet. One lady came by, just happened to be driving by, and she said, are you, you y'all going to give that water out later? And we said, we'll be happy to load. We loaded her up with two or three cases of water at the time, and she just was so blessed that we were there. Thank y'all. Thank y'all very much for bringing, bringing necessities to us. In such a brutal environment, you can imagine Louisiana residents being thrilled to see help arrive. Here's David Renshaw again. The community response has been um, overwhelmingly positive. Uh, to give you an example, uh, through our networking and, and outreach programs, uh, we were able to obtain a donated 53-foot, um, we call it reefer truck, which is a refrigerated truck. Those right now run for about $800 a day at rent. Um, we were able to get the get one at no charge. Uh, for unlimited uses, as long as we maintain the fuel, which we are doing so. Uh, getting to that point, um, we have uh, thousands of pounds of, of ice in there for the membership, and uh, it broke down on us, so uh, started leaking. We then contacted the locals who we bought the ice from, and uh, they, I asked them if they knew somebody that we could call, and they says, look, you're from out of state. Um, they won't get to you. So let us call. Uh, they called and um, attack came out within that day, within a, a couple of hours, um, ended up replacing the alternator belt. And the next day, unfortunately, broke down again and went through the same process. The tech came out and uh, it was a loose, uh, loose nut, loose wire on the alternator. And to this day, I, I say, hey, send, send me the invoice, and they won't send me the invoice because they said, thank you for what you're doing for our community. Robbie said the reaction of people in the affected areas was telling. You know, the biggest thing that I take out of it whenever I do it is uh, how much people appreciate it. You know, these, 
you go into a lot of these areas where they don't have electricity, they're not going to, we went into some places that hadn't had electricity in three days, in three weeks. And you take them water and you take them ice and it's a big deal to them, you know. So that's the biggest thing I get out of it is how much people appreciate it. And then the other part is, is uh, you know, the pride you have of being a teamster when you show up. People don't forget that, you know, when they see your shirt, they see your logo, they hear that you're teamsters and you show up and you do something like that whenever they're most need of something. You know, that's something that's re really stands out, makes our union stand out, you know, and I, that's something that I get most out of it. So there's a lot of people who work in areas that don't have a whole lot of unions. You know, I live in a place like Baldwin County. We do not have union halls in Baldwin County, but when you go next door either way to Pensacola or to Mobile, which are larger cities to the east and west of us, they have several unions. They have IBWs. They have uh, your, your painters unions. They have, you know, or Teamsters unions and stuff like that. So I think it brings up awareness in the community because, you know, first of all, they get they get a, a sense of, of exactly what unions are, what companies are affiliated with unions and things like that. And also, you never know some of the people that you see or meet, you know, they may end up getting a job one day where that company is a union company and it may, you know, may make them want to join the union, you know, help grow their union just because they see the activities and things they do, not only just by protecting their employees, but also you know, taking care of their employees when they're on the clock and when they're off the clock. I like doing this kind of stuff because I like helping people. I like to volunteer a lot. I volunteer a lot in my community. And when I get a chance to volunteer with the union to help other communities, I always take advantage of it. It's just something I've, it's just something I've always done, you know, trying to volunteer. Um, you know, and like I said, when you do it sometimes and when you see these people and you're, you know, they're most in need and you show up and you give them a case of water or something like that, yeah, it's pretty rewarding, and like I said, it's uh, you know, it's also a good represent representation of the Teamsters in our local 991 out of Mobile, and that's you know, that's what you want to do. You want to be a good representative of your community. And it feels pretty good. I mean, like I said, it's rewarding. It feels good. It makes you feel like you've done something for somebody. You know, like I like I said, these these people, they don't have power. They're miserable. A lot of times, they don't have uh, any kind of communication of what's going on around them for the last couple of days. So they. They haven't been out or anything like that. So a lot of times when they see you, you're kind of like the news for them when they ask you how bad is it in other places. So, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's a lot. I mean, it's, you know, you have to get to be a very understanding of their situation. You know, there's been times we've dropped, I've dropped off things with with my partners and, you know, you, you got grown, grown men and grown women that are crying just because they're glad to see you or they're glad to see the goods that you're bringing them. And some of it might even, you know, might not even be the stuff that, that you purchased or bought, it could be something that somebody else bought that you're just moving from one location to another. I mean, we've dropped off things for school systems and had coordinators from school systems tell us how much they appreciate and cry. And then we've, you know, we've dropped things off at churches and stuff. So, I mean, it's just not, you know, it's the whole community. You're there helping as many people as you can. So it's, I mean, it's rewarding. Kenny agreed. These people welcome you with open arms. It's almost like, a lost friend from 10 years ago, uh, the appreciation of just watching you pull up, you know, watching us pull up and unload. I mean, there might be 10 guys there at the local and every one of them would come up and say, thank you for everything you're doing. And we tell them the same thing. Thank you for taking care of the members and your community. Cameron Brown said it strengthened the bond between the union and the community. With the Teamsters, it's all about brotherhood and sisterhood. And um, that's what it's all about. Once you, you know, they always say um, membership has its privileges. Well, this is one of the privileges that what we do for our members is that when they, whenever they are in need, we, we always look for a helping hand and help one another. And that's what we're all about. Is a brotherhood, teamsters. We, you know, we have a, a bond for each other. No matter what happens, you know, no matter how far and wide, um, because we had different locals and joint councils came down there to help out with the uh, the disaster relief. And so that's what it's all about. Is that you know, and I could say like if something happened where my local is, and you know my house get blown away or nothing, you know, I would, you know, expect the teachers to be there for me to help out and then, you know, look at whatever the things that, that I need to get done. And that's what it's all about.
helping one uh, one another that, you know, when times get rough, uh, disasters hit, we we will be there there to help and try to get you back on your feet as fast as possible. We are a labor union and you know, labor unions we fight for, you know, workers' rights and we fight for the people. And so we already know and understand like, you know, how our we live in our communities and we know our communities best. And they always look up to, you know, um, labor unions as um, those who fight for the people. Everyone who went down to Louisiana came out of UPS. With the dual crises of the pandemic and the hurricane, the role of union members as essential workers has never been more critical to the foundation of our social fabric. You know, as a UPS driver and a Teamster, you know, I'll start delivering, um, you know, we'll, I started noticing with like, like delivering water. I would deliver water in boxes, prepping, prepping before a hurricane. So people are just ordering like that. And then when they can't get to the stores and do different things, we're bringing it. That's another part of it too. Even after, even after we do this hurricane relief stuff, I go back to my job delivering for UPS and I'm bringing goods in. One of the first people that really step up and start sending supplies in and getting supplies delivered is Teamsters. The Teamsters and the AFL-CIO, they open their pocketbooks. They don't have to, but they do. Everyone I've worked, I've been there where they've spent tons of money to help out communities uh, that are hit hard and to go in and help the members. Uh, I've seen it firsthand and it, and it's just not the members because we do help the communities to. You know, you're in a, you're in a disaster area. Nobody, you look around, all you can see is a power company or a utilities company. And then you have somebody like the Teamsters or the afl or somebody like that show up with goods and things that you need when you can't really get to a store or stores don't have them available in the area. I think that, you know, that kind of really highlights it because, you know, water and things are essential to everybody. You know, when you show up with those kind of, items in a time of great need yeah i mean it really does kind of highlight your role especially when they find out you come from so far off you know they they know by looking at you a lot of times when you start talking to them if you're not from that area you know they they know that you didn't you didn't just come from down the road you came from three or four hours away to help them so i think it you know definitely highlights the role of the teamster in our locals uh you know i'm sure the people in those communities have a high regard for you know teamsters when they leave i mean who wouldn't like i said if you were and desperate need of something and somebody showed up with two twenty four truckloads of stuff that's worth about ten thousand dollars and said, Here, take this and give it to your members. I mean, that's you know, I'm sure they would hold that in high regard. I know if it was me, I would. I would think most people would. Everyone I spoke to agreed. Disaster relief work embodies the values of what it means to be a teamster. I think everybody that we came in contact with were very pleased to see us out there. It's not like they, they were going, well, y'all are just riding around wasting time or wasting fuel or, or, or basically causing a traffic jam. Everybody that we came up to was, was very eager to say, I am glad y'all are here. Thank y'all very much for setting us up. The Boilermakers, we got over there. They didn't have anything when we got there. And by the time we left, two, two and a half, three days later, the Boilermakers, they said, please don't send us any more water. We had them fully stocked with water. We had them fully stocked with flashlight, extension cords, tarpoleums, gasoline, gas cans, food, diapers, indigent diapers. So a uh, numerous of items that people could come in. They had people from New Orleans coming up for the school that worked with the uh, school system in New Orleans that were coming up and using Slidell. That was the closest location at the time that was set up. And uh, they were very pleased to see us and very happy to know that, uh, that we could do this in a matter of a uh, few hours. Uh, what it means to be a Teamster is, you know, um, you're, you're the face of, you know, the labor union. You know, uh, when they, every time you hear Teamsters or uh, IBT, you know that what we stand for is workers' rights and, and, and we stand up for the people. And we stand up for working families, and um, that's what it really means to me that I'm a part of a group, a brotherhood, sisterhood, 
that stands up for working people and, and for their rights and, as such. I think it brings us all together. I think that it shows what Teamsters can do. I think that we are we're a strong union. And we're strong people. We can move stuff. We can we can take care of our community and take care of our own. Plus, plus all everyone that's in a union. Money is our values because you know unions are basically. I mean, they help. We help people. You know, we help our members when it comes to uh, working with their employers. Uh, I think it helps. You know, and it shows that we help them in their community too. That not only do you have their back at work, but you have their back at home. And I think that's important. I mean, that's what you. That's what you want your union to do. When you have a problem, you like to be able to turn to your union for help because you don't, you're not getting help from one person. You know, you're getting help from your entire local and you're getting help from the entire international. I mean, there's resources. There's lots of resources in unions, just like uh, this disaster relief and things like that. I mean, there's all kinds of resources for many different things at our union. I mean, we give out scholarships to colleges for students who uh, are children of Teamsters members. So, yeah, I think it's a big deal. I think it really highlights the whole idea of what the Teamsters do. Like I said, they don't just, you know, take care of you at work, but they take care of you, you know, period. I mean, that's, you know, it's it's worth being a member of a union and having those kind of things that you can access to help you in many different areas. Being a union steward for 16 years now, it's been great. I just, I love helping people. And, uh, and that's why, I do the, the disaster relief. It, it's the great feeling to, to help out your members and your community. Well, it, take, it takes all of us to get it done. You know, everybody, we, the whole thing is one big disaster, and it takes uh, a little pull from everybody to get what needs to get done done. One, one uh, entity is not going to be able to accomplish the whole thing. We've all got to stick together. We got to reach out, touch base with each other. What do we need? What What do your guys or girls need down there that can help them? And then, logistic-wise, who can we get to get it there? And how can we get it set up? This is what it's about: brother and sisterhood. I'm not out here. We're not out here by ourselves. We're We're a family. And when the family calls and family needs help, you don't ask. What day do you need help? You don't ask how much do you need help. When do you need help? You say, I'll be there. What do you need? And then you go get it done. for listening to this episode of the Teamsters podcast. Join us next time for another episode from America's Strongest Union. And be sure to check out www.teamster.org regularly for updates.